Before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge people without whom this paper and the work I'm working on about imperial oil would never have been done. Uh, the first is Robert Taylor Vasey, who was the uh, chief archiv oil, the archivist for imperial oil from the 1880s to the 1980s to, to uh, 2008, and uh, who organized uh, imperial's records uh, to a very high degree and saw to it that they were transferred before he retired to Glenbow Muse uh, Ar Museum and Archives in Calgary. And secondly, to Doug Cass and his uh, staff at, Cal at uh, Glenbow Museum for uh, the way in which they've uh, enabled people to have access to that, to those records. For 130 years, from its establishment in 1880, to 2010, Imperial Oil was the largest petroleum company in Canada. In 2009, Suncor merged with Petro-Canada and Imperial fell to second place. But even in 2017, Imperial's revenues were virtually equal to those of Suncor and its profits were five times larger than its rival. During those 130 years, Imperial was not only the largest company in terms of assets, revenues, and net earnings, but for much of that period, it towered over others in the Canadian oil and gas sector. In 1948, for example, even before the impact of the Duke discovery took effect, Imperial sales revenues and net profits were twice the size of its two largest competitors, British American, which was later taken over by Gulf, and uh, Texaco, Canada, which began as McCall Frontenac and was taken over, acquired by Imperial in 1991. Even in the 1990s, Imperial's sales and assets were equal to those of its two major rivals, Shell Canada and Petro Canada. Its share of gas of the gasoline market in Canada uh, fell from 60 percent around nine, in the 1950s, but even now it controls over one-third of that market. Not only was it Canada's largest petroleum producer company, integrated petroleum company, but it would not be out of line to say it was present at the creation of virtually every shift in the industry after 1900. When demand shifted from kerosene to gasoline in the early 1900s, Imperial acquired held the patents to the most efficient thermal cracking processes, which I'll talk about later. When gas and some oil was discovered in the Turner Valley in Alberta, Imperial arrived shortly thereafter and bought up the largest gas company whose owners included uh, Archie Dingman, James Lockheed, and R.B. Bennett. In 1924, its subsidiary Royalite I should say it's hidden subsidiary, it never admitted it owned it, uh, struck the largest oil uh, find in uh, Alberta before uh, 1947 at Leduc in Turner Valley. Imperial built the first pipeline that linked Alberta oil fields to the central Canada in the early 1950s, and at one point in the 1950s, it held one half to one, one third to one half interest in every, virtually every oil pipeline in the country. When the oil sands began to be exploited in the 1960s and 70s, Imperial was a founding member of the Syncrude Consortium and developed its own project at Cold Lake uh, a decade later. But from 1899 on to the present, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the equity in Imperial Oil has been held by Standard Oil of New Jersey, uh, later known more recently as Exxon, and now Exxon Mobil. During the energy crisis of the 1970s and 80s, Imperial Oil became the poster child of multinational corporations in Canada accused of gauge gouging gasoline consumers and seeking to control virtually every phase of the industry, exploration, drilling, refining, transportation, and distribution. More recently, it has been charged with following the lead 
of its parent Exxon in suppressing and seeking to discredit research, even by its own scientists, showing the connections between carbon emissions and global warming. In 1981, amidst the energy crisis of that time, in a report entitled The State of Competition in the Canadian Petroleum Industry, Robert Bertrand, Director of Research and Combines Investigation Act, asserted, quote, the petroleum industry of Canada has been even less competitive than its counterparts elsewhere. This was the result of its domination by a single company, Imperial Oil Limited. Not only did Imperial use its market power and connections with Exxon to limit competition, but also used its technological lead to block innovation and new entrants into the market. In response, Jack Armstrong, who was the chief executive officer of Imperial, offered this defense, quote, access to a large international pool of research and technology, not just by Imperial, but of all foreign majors, has helped build an oil industry in Canada, which is among the best and most efficient in the world. <coughs> it could be argued that both views were right. And to illustrate my point, I want to spend, I want to touch upon three episodes in the history of the relationship between Imperial Oil and Exxon since 1900, or actually going back to the 1880s, each focused on the role of technology in shaping that relationship and the industry. Okay. Canadians Canadians assigned bragging rights for the first oil well, uh, first commercial oil well, to James Miller Williams, who developed the first con commercial well in Oil Springs in 1858, a year before Colonel Edwin Drake's well at Titusville, Pennsylvania, which is you, Americans, of course, regard as the beginning of the oil industry. As in the U.S., in the early years of the oil industry, the oil industry was a boom and bust business, with retailers trying to restrain the output of the many drillers, first in oil springs, which went dry in the early 1860s, and then later at Petrolia nearby in southwestern Ontario. In 1880, a group of retailers in London, Ontario, and Petrolia, after failing to, uh, failing to form an enduring cartel, consolidated into Imperial Oil Limited. Imperial's emergence coincided with the election of the Conservatives under Sir John A. Mac oh, John A. Macdonald and the National Policy Tariffs. Imperial owners were among the first to line up to get protection under the National Policy. They wrapped themselves in the flag in this case, of course, of the British Empire, uh, hence the name Imperial Oil. <clears throat> and they posed themselves as defenders against the American octopus, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust. But Imperial faced a problem. The oil from Petrolia was, quote, sour. It contained a large degree of sulfur. And since the key product for oil at that time was kerosene for illumination, for lighting, that meant that people who used that oil uh, in their homes had a pervasive skunk smell, and it became known as skunk, skunk oil in the trade. And the preferred product was the imported product from standard from Pennsylvania, which was sweet oil, despite the tariff. Now, Imperial, in 1884, hired a German chemist named Hermann Frosch. Uh, he was researching methods of reducing sulfur, offering, and they offered him a seat on the board of Imperial, as well as a very substantial fee. Two years later, John D. Rockefeller hired Frosch away from Imperial by offering him the largest laboratory in the United States, as well as shares in Standard Oil, 
which were considerably higher in value than Imperials at the time. Frasch went on to uh, complete his process of desulfurization of, uh, of oil, and uh, in a, by the 1888, Standard Oil was supplying rivals, competitors to Imperial Oil in Canada with access to Frasch's desulfurization uh, process. This critically wounded Imperial Oil, and very soon it was facing significant com competition from, uh, primarily from own, uh, companies owned by Standard, or at least secretly owned by Standard Oil in Canada. Among them was uh, a company in Toronto, which was owned by a man named Samuel Rogers, whose uh, son became uh, the founder of Rogers Communications. Actually, I guess it was his grandson who owns it today. In 1899, when the liberal regime in Ottawa was beginning to reduce the tariff protections that Imperial had, uh, the company saw uh, it, its fate was sealed, and it negotiated a deal with Standard Oil in which uh, it, uh, Standard got 75% of the companies of Imperial's shares and control of the company. First thing that Standard did when it came in was to close uh, the petroleum fields, uh, the, the refineries at Petrolia, and shift all operations to Sarnia, where they had uh, the frash process in, in operation. For over 10 years, Imperial remained moribund. Its sales were managed in New York City, uh, its board met hardly at all, although the minority shareholders who were members of the board received very rich dividends and were quite satisfied with the outcome. Um, and to all intents and purposes, it only existed as a brand name, Imperial Oil, uh, otherwise managed, controlled by Standard Oil. In 1911 and 1912, two things happened. The first was a challenge from Royal Dutch Shell. Royal Dutch Shell was uh, the formation of Henri Detterding in 1910, and he set out to compete with uh, Standard Oil for global control of the oil industry. The other thing that happened was that Standard Oil itself was broken up by an antitrust decree by the U.S. Supreme Court and ordered, Standard Oil Trust was ordered to uh, dissolve into a multitude of what were known uh, later on as little standards. Uh, this antitrust measure in the long term didn't work very well because, as you probably know, in 2000, uh, Standard Oil, um, Standard, I should say Standard of New Jersey, merged with Standard of New York, which was mobile, to form, uh, the, again, the largest oil company in the world. Second largest to Shell, actually. Now, Imperial wound up under the control of Standard Oil of New Jersey, which later on, of course, became Exxon and Exxon Mobil. Imperial was bequeathed the uh, management of, of uh, Standard Oil's up-and-coming star, Walter Teagle, the man who it said would fill John Dee's shoes. And so Teagle actually combined his position on the board of, of uh, directors of Standard Oil, his uh, responsibility for foreign affairs for Standard Oil with managing uh, managing and being president of the Canadian company Imperial. And this was really the salvation of Imperial. Teagle increased the capitalization of, uh, of Imperial from $15 million to $50 million. He built refineries across the country, initiated exploration for oil in Alberta, which eventually led to the discovery of Leduc. Um, built up a tanker fleet for the lakes, 
and arranged for Imperial to manage the International Petroleum Company in Peru and Colombia, which they did until 1948 when Imperial sold uh, that, their company back, that company back to Exxon for $80 million. The oil market was shifting from kerosene to gasoline, as I indicated, around 19, between 1900 and 1910 with uh, motor, Ford Motor Company. Teagle arranged for, a, uh, for Imperial to get a thermal, to the thermal cracking process that had been developed by Standard of Indiana and ensured that they got it on very fair terms and uh, controlled the, uh, and basically uh, ensured that they had uh, virtual control of that particular process, at least for the first 25 years in Canada. In the 1940s, when the Second World War came and the Japanese seized the rubber supplies of, Can of uh, Malaysia, Malaya, uh, Canada, the Canadian government, I should say, C.D. Howe, if you wish, uh, decided that he wanted to develop synthetic rubber in Canada. At that time, Standard Oil of New Jersey held the international patents for synthetic rubber acquired from I.G. Farben. So Tao turned to Imperial to carry out the uh, development of synthetic rubber along with a crown corporation in, uh, in Sarnia. And this eventually led to the development of the petrochemical industry, which, as you can see, is celebrated as Chemical Valley in, uh, in uh, in Ontario. Then we get into the period of the uh, oil sands. The oil sands had been regarded as a potential petroleum gold conda for Canada for many, many years. Uh, in the 1920s, Professor Carl, Carl Clark had developed a process to process uh, bitumen from sand. The big problem for uh, those who wanted to develop it was much of the oil, much of the bitumen was located far underground. Uh, the question was, how were you going to get it up out of the ground? In the 1950s, a man named L.W. Natland, who worked for Richfield Company, decided that the way to do it was to use uh, atomic bombs in the oil sands and literally to use the, uh, the atomic bombs to blast the bitumen to the surface. Imperial Oil, with the blessings of Standard, joined in a consortium which was going to carry this out. Now, it didn't happen, but in the end, uh, in, in the end uh, Imperial Oil maintained the consortium, which became Syncrude and went into conventional uh, oil mining at uh, the surface level at Fort McMurray. However, at the same time, Imperial Oil was developing a, uh, a, a deeper mine at Cold Lake, a, deep, a deeper uh, oil mining process. And a man named Roger Butler, who worked for Imperial Oil Research, developed the process called steam-assisted gravity. Let me see if I can get this right. Steam-assisted steam gravity drainage which was the process which would use water to blast down deep underground and then let the uh, bitumen rise to the surface where it could be processed. So in the end, this, although environmentalists still considered this SAGD process to be just as environmentally unfriendly as surface mining, it is a major way for, uh, for the industry to get to the deeper deposits of oil and coal lake. So over the years, Imperial Oil moved from losing its, its independence as a result of its technological loss of Hermann Frosch to depending on Standard Oil for, its, uh, for the patents which enabled it to control its market uh, to finally, um, finally developing its own research capabilities. So the good news for Canadian nationalists is that Imperial Oil developed its own research and development capacity uh, to the benefit of Canada. The bad news, of course, is that Standard Oil of New Jersey still owns 70% of Imperial Oil. Thank you.